It is a wonderful pleasure and happiness for me to meet you all here. Uh, the game that uh, I will be showing today is the Key of Whisper Steel, and you should be uh, able to um, dig deeper into this game because uh, you should have already your design docs. Uh, I will be referencing elements of the design document as there is a fair share of things that I'd suggest you read by yourself and uh, focus on it. Uh, but what I want to do today is to give you an overall idea of this game uh, and explain things that, uh, from experience, we know that may be confusing. Uh, if there will be any questions, uh, I would uh, ask you to write them in the chat. And uh, uh, excellent and wonderful Hanya here will be scouring the chat for your uh, messages and informations and will be uh, stopping me in my tracks, uh, ordering me to focus on your queries. Uh, yes, uh, the main part will take about an hour of me speaking. Maybe we'll have uh, a break during uh, me speaking, uh, maybe uh, before the Q&A session, we'll see how it goes. Uh, let us begin then. So, here we go. What will we learn today? We have three main topics that uh, are very important to address in this game. So, first, first, the structure of the game and what is it all about. Then, the technical preparations for the game. Uh, so, how should you prepare it? and how should you prepare yourself and your participants for it. Uh, and then the briefing for the game, how you should sum up the game with participants. Uh, mm, several times, uh, mainly during speaking about the structure of the game, I will be refer referencing technical elements and the briefing elements uh, as they all uh, fit into each other. Uh, and in the technical uh, element and uh, the briefing section, uh, I will touch upon that like core elements of this, uh, of those sections. So be aware that informations will be flowing uh, throughout entire uh, presentations about technical uh, issues and the briefing issues. Uh, and now, word about uh, our beloved design document. I will share with you now the design document to which I will be referencing um, during uh, the presentation. And it's gone. Why is it gone? Oh, here it is. Uh, so it's uh, quite pretty. I like the design here. Anyways, uh, you have uh, here all the informations uh, that in the future will be important for you. So goals and uh, technical issues, location, how to how to look for the location. This is something that you on yourself will uh, by yourself will have to uh, look up and uh, act accordingly uh, while preparing the game. Also. Uh, the requirements for the staff, target group with what type of people, uh, to what type of people this game will be most appealing, uh, and uh, also budget. Uh, but what we will be uh, looking at are things starting from this point on, from the story and uh, throughout uh, the gameplay, and then to the debriefing. So that's, that's enough for now. Uh, uh, okay, we're back. Uh, structure of the game. In the overall sense, it's uh, what uh, I believe this game is really about. Uh, so, it's quite obvious that uh, the core uh, idea of the game uh, is 
doesn't have to be clearly communicated to the participants. So the participants will receive a little different version of the story. But uh, for me, uh, this theme is about working in teams to achieve a goal, uh, creating a personalized story, mirroring the group identity, like identity of the groups playing it, uh, learning more about relationships and learning about, more about uh, themselves um, throughout shared experience. So those are four cornerstones of uh, the game. And the primary goal uh, of the game is care, taking care about things um, and people and yourself and elements in your mind. Uh, I have specified it um, to make participants care for each other so that they may rely on that bond in face of radical behavior and will be less likely to participate in those radical behaviors. You might have uh, heard, correctly so, that this game is about LGBTQ community. It is true, it was created as an, a tool to instigate dialogue about uh, LGBTQ community, but game is only a tool. You cannot hit your participants over the head with, uh, especially if they are from the background that would be radicalized against LGBTQ community. Uh, you cannot hit them over the head with uh, ideas straight on. Uh, this game serves as a preparatory mean to touch upon the subject as care and being close to each other and sharing a bond is something uh, that, in my opinion, uh, is a way to uh, tap touch upon these subjects later. But uh, the LGBTQ notions and ideas will not come up uh, overtly until the debriefing. And it's only up to your discretion. Will you touch upon them or not? Because this game will serve purpose, uh, previous elements, uh, just fine without referring this subject. It's uh, multitasked. Uh, to, it can be used to a lot of things. So that's the primary goal. And more straightforward, uh, we want them in this game, we want participants to immerse in a certain mood, emotion, emotional state, that being here, taking care of someone. Mm, caring about something of or someone. Open up to others during the game. Extract the feelings of caring about someone, like trying to pinpoint those feelings. Look at them specifically. Of course, encourage those feelings and, of course, have some fun. Uh, the secondary goals, so things that we might as well be able to achieve during this game, are learning about uh, more about the group. So you as facilitators will be able to gather information about your participants. And those information will be uh, stockpiled uh, in form of their uh, materials that they have produced during the game. So you, they will be able to, uh, you can be analyzing them, you can use those materials later for, uh, for some reason or some to, to some end. Then strengthening the bonds within the group, because as we try them to care about each other, they will in inevitably strengthen the bonds within the group and introduce knowledge about how relationships are formed. Because the events in the game mirror metaphorically of course, uh, the situation, uh, the structure of forming the relationships in real life. Narrative. The, this is uh, the lore of the game, the story uh, to which we would like to uh, bring our participants in. Uh, before, however, uh, we uh, dive deeper into the lore. And uh, bear in mind, I will tell you about it. I have made sure to introduce every aspect uh, um, to you, but the game is um, loosely, very loosely based on the uh, 
TV series and, uh, and uh, comic book series, Lock and Key. But you don't have to reference it overtly. It will work just fine if your participants don't know it. Uh, then there's no point in going deeper over it. Uh, also, remember that this is your game and elements of the aesthetics of the lore can be changed by you according, for example, to the local legend or some local custom or something to, to make it more, uh, the lore of the story, narrative of the story is there to make it more accessible to people and more understandable. So if in your area, because th this game was made for, uh, for Greece and Greek kids told me that this is something that they would enjoy to immerse in, that they like this series and they want to see it. But if you know from your experience that there's something that your participants would like to see, you can uh, freely uh, change things in the lore, except from the core. And I will show you the core right now. So in this story, what is the core? is that they are demons. This is what you see right here uh, is the demon from the from this comic book series. Uh, and demons are whatever you make of it, but important thing is that they are uh, plotting against humanity and they are eating different uh, aspects of humanity. They eat memories, they eat dreams, they take nourishment from the psychic and emotional things that we produce. So that's, they cannot just destroy us, uh, but because they would die of hunger then, but they are uh, overall, overly malicious creatures that want to harm us and take away uh, our happiness. Then we got demon hunters. This uh, demon hunter right here is uh, one of the uh, more badass characters in, this, uh, in the series. Uh, demon hunters uh, specialize in hunting demons, uh, protecting people from them. Uh, and also by doing so, they gain uh, bit by bit more power that distinguishes them from human. A very advanced demon hunter is a magician. He possesses superpowers, basically. Like this guy here, he, he got wings. And the very, very important thing for the game, like the core, there is Whisper Steel. Whisper Steel is basically, the, this is uh, the stuff of demons. They are made from it. They, it's their bones, it's their flesh. When a demon is defeated or torn, uh, into shreds, you can craft items from their remnants. remnants. And those uh, keys uh, are metaphoric and literal at the same time, because those keys, uh, a physical object, they can be not shaped in the way of a key. They can be something else, but they unlock everything. If there is something that can be unlocked, there is a key made from Whisper Steel for this particular thing. So a key from Whisper Steel can unlock emotions, can unlock uh, memories, can unlock uh, future, past powers. That's why demon hunters gathering keys of Whisper Steel gain more and more uh, power, basically. And so those beats, like those three elements are the narrative beats of the story. You can put it in uh, any other clothing, like uh, any other uh, aesthetical setting, and it will work just fine, provided you keep to those three main elements. And if not, you can just read the comic books or watch the series and get more lore and more fluff out of it. The story here, um, is like the narrative is the general premise of the world, the general rules that are there for the world. And the story here is what happened in the world of the game before our players are introduced. Things that you see here are what set in motion the events that uh, in the end uh, allow our participants 
to join the story and be a part of it. The story is about two people, Alex and Robin. I will refer to them later on as A and R. That's because uh, names Alex and Robin uh, should be, for all intents and purposes, left as sexually ambiguous. If you don't wish to uh, go deeper into this uh, element of LGBTQ, you don't have uh, to strain so much, but this is something very important later on. They are both demon hunters. They join forces to find a powerful book. They don't trust each other. They need to cooperate. They learn to trust each other eventually. Then they fall in love. They are tricked by a demon Tal, which one of you will play. So one of the facilitators will be uh, reenacting as this demon. Uh, and they lose memories. So these are nine elements of the story. Uh, nine uh, like base structure of what happened. I will now go a little deeper into these aspects. So there is Book of Locks. Uh, that's why I call it because it is the same time the book that contains information about the locks. So what can be unlocked. Uh, and also it, it is a, um, a heritage of Locke family, of Locke's family. Uh, it has the power to extract Whisper Steel from Fallen Demon. Uh, but unfortunately, the book drains life from those that use it. So in the end, it will always be fatal for the bearer. Robin Locke, which I mentioned earlier, uh, searches for the book to avenge the family uh, which was killed and get back his legacy. And he's the last of locks. Uh, Robin family was killed by Demon Tal. Unfortunately, this is something I must mention here, Robin does not know how his family, his or hers, that is, see, that's a problem. Robin, which can be a male or female, doesn't know what killed uh, the Locke's family. Uh, only uh, thing that this person knows is that they were killed by a demon and he hates demon, he wants to take revenge. While searching for the book, Robin meets, meets Alex, uh, this person who can be, again, a male or a female, uh, is also a demon hunter. And despite their differences, they work together in search for the book. After a very rocky start, uh, because they are from different areas, different countries, they are, have problems communicating, they begin to feel growing affection to each other. But Robin, blinded by the need for vengeance, vengeance does not tell Alex that book drains life, that this is actually dangerous. Then, having found the book, they witness the life draining effect of its presence. So it is no longer possible to ignore it. And of course, Alex uh, gets what's going on, understands what's going on. And the book slowly kills them both as it treats them both as its owners because they both found it, they both got it. They have to hide, uh, they have a fight because. Uh, as Robin kept secrets, Alex is uh, uh, unsurprisingly irritating about, uh, irritated about this. Uh, but eventually, uh, they make an uh, understanding. They are able to reach an understanding between themselves. Uh, it becomes clear that they have fallen in love too deep to split their ways. Uh, and now they decide to live uh, the few days that they have left together. But Robin decides, uh, again, not telling Alex, that Alex must, must survive, and no matter the cost. Robin unlocks the demon bound by the by family of flocks, not knowing that 
This is the reason why they are dead, because they sacrifice they li their lives to lock this demon up. The demon, demon is named Tal, and this demon offers a deal to, Ale uh, to Robin. Alex will live, but the price are Robin's best memories. So Robin agrees, but as the best memories of their lives were the ones spent together and the things that they learned about each other, the things that they know now about each other, they lose up all memories because they have mutually erased them and they are now uh, lost in amnesia, not knowing what's going on. And, uh, and it was Tal's plan all along to get the last of locks as now he is free. Tal breaks the seal of locks. This is the thing that you see here. This is the main uh, symbol of the game. And, uh, and this is the titled uh, key of whisper seal here. And the seal of locks scatters in a hidden, uh, in a demon scatters it in, uh, in the places that R and A visited. That's why we will be walking around these places. Then demon disguises as a demon hunter, planning to devour those that will come here to save A and R because he knows that people will come. Uh, mentor, another one of you, because another this is another part played by a facilitator, uh, a friend both of A and R who met them in the first place. So Mentor have, uh, has his own investment in this. He met those people together. Uh, witnessing what happened to them, organizes his students. Those are participants, people with, uh, with uh, kids that you will be playing game with, and rushes to the area to save uh, A and R. And here we have the entire story written down. I believe there was uh, a lot of, a lot to take in. So do you have any questions at this at this stage? Because this is the story that starts it all. Okay, so we don't have any questions. Are you Let sure? us because this uh, is a good moment to ask it. <laughs> well, okay, so but it didn't follow the story. Mm. Please, could you ask the question out loud? At this, uh, or Hanya, read it to me. No, no, no. I'm just Martin. I'm just uh, um, telling people not to be shy. But if ah, yes, of course. Everything and you followed, then you are perfect participants of this training. My my apologies. Okay. I hope it's not confusing. Yeah. I really tried because uh, people uh, found this story a bit confusing, so I took extra steps to make it as clear as possible and because it's important for what we're going to do later. How many spoilers? <laughs> uh, here now, all the spoilers. Like, this is... This no! Is, this is everything no! is spoiled right now. I have spoiled everything. Ah, oh, no! for the story, for the lock and key. For the TV series, yeah, and no, no, no spoilers at all. I told you okay. that this is loosely based. It's it has really not so much to do with the um, with the the, uh, the the comics or the movies. It's just trying to uh, touch upon the uh, vibe of the of the lock and key series. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> so no spoilers, no problem. Uh, uh, yes, so yes, uh, we can, if this issue is already settled, we can carry on, I guess. No other questions? Okay, so now NPCs. What are NPCs? Non-player characters. You, my dear facilitators. In this game, you will need three people to run this game, to run it. One of them will be an overseer, like this person that uh, actually is a facilitator, that facilitates everything to happen uh, and makes sure that everything goes smoothly. But then there are two actors, which can be facilitators as well, but 
I seriously recommend uh, for the those people to have at least like the m- m- mediocre modicum of uh, experience in acting or role playing or or like s- s- stage performance in general because it is on the shoulders of these people that the uh, energy of the game lies uh, the more those NPCs go deep into their character, in the mm, clothing, in the mannerisms of speech, uh, in the behavior, the, the deeper they uh, immerse themselves in the characters, the more immersive the entire game will be for the participants as they will be uh, following their example uh, instantly, intuitively. Not all, mind you, but Generally, this is the rule. Kids want to be uh, want want to role play. They want to immerse in things like that. So, mentor is a veteran demon hunter, tutor of the participants, and friend of the main protagonists. You can change everything about this person, everything about personality, about of mentor. But these three core elements must remain. Demon Tal is the demon of the book, basically. Uh, He was set free by main protagonists, and he is now masquerading as a demon hunter to manipulate protagonists. So, uh, okay, this in a moment. So our participants will be simultaneously led by these two figures, not knowing that this figure is a demon. You can uh, improvise a name for for this person because it will be in documents, it's only named by the demon name. Uh, or you can just use name Tal, not telling that, well, this is a demon. Uh, but this is important that uh, both of these um, figures will try to bring uh, as close bond with the participants to establish as as deep a bond as possible, uh, but for obviously different reasons. A large disclaimer, which I disclaimed earlier, but there's not enough uh, times to disclaim it. They must, R and A must be ambiguous. If you wish to go for the LGBTQ message, they must be ambiguous. Why? I will reference this more, but here you should receive at least some information. If you do not obey this rule and it will be implied, their genders will be implied, you will lose an element of your debriefing as it is very important in the story making aspect of this game that participants guess their genders because they will assume their genders based on the actions of the on the situation that they will face and in the end you can ask them okay so what were the genders of alex and robin and they will and you will see that kids will have different answers because one Considered one group considered and was hell bent on deciding that Robin was a male and uh, and Alex was a female, while different group may have uh, converse conception. And then you ask them, and this is the the kicker in the the debriefing and all the debriefing. If you want to go for the LGBTQ route, leads to this point where you ask them, and would their relationship be any less if they were of the same sex? of the same gender, would it? But we will go there soon. Now the starting point, and this is something I wish you to consider and concentrate on. These are four elements that players must know. Like this is, this is very, very, very important. You can omit and probably you should uh, omit many things like the story of uh, A and R. Do not go into details because this story will unravel itself during the game. But players must know that they are young demon hunters. 
They are already young demon hunters. You can use this aspect to hype them up, make some preparatory uh, activities with them. You do you. Their leader is mentor. So mentor is a already important person to them and they must be informed that this is your mentor, this is your teacher, this is your Dumbledore, whatever, you, you call him how you want. They want to save R and A and defeat the demon. They should be informed that demon is named Tal. So uh, I'd rather go with a different uh, name for the second facilitator. Uh, they should not know that he is a demon. And they need to investigate through gathering the letters with, written by A and R. Basically, those will be journals of uh, Robin Locke. They will be gathering uh, Robin's journals. And the story will progress by them gathering another piece of the journal of Robin Locke. Uh, so remember, the players are demon hunters, their leader's mentor, they are here to save A and R, and there's a demon here, and they will be investigating, gathering, gathering pieces of, the, of their memories, gathering uh, letters. Now, uh, investigation has a set frame. So the pieces of the puzzle are very linear. But the interpretations of the events and hence the final story, that is all up to participants to create. So if they come to you and say, well, I don't understand. What am I supposed to do? Uh, then you say, look what's written here. It is your job as demon hunter to understand this person, to imagine this person to go into the shoes of this person and to find the way to recreate the miss missing elements of this memory. Because if you want to find the elements of the key, you must enter the scraps of memories of A and R scattered around this area. And once you enter their memories, you will find the shard. So I disclaim it here. They, it's the game here goes into the creative territory. Whatever they create will be awesome as long as it is their creation. And you will see that uh, as the synergy, meaning the energy that occurs in the group kicks in, they will create wonderful stories here. Gameplay. So we ended the uh, lore and story part. Now we go to the uh, nitty gritty stuff uh, concerning the structure of the game. So basically we have three large elements which are pretty unwieldy on themselves. Because in the beginning, you must prepare briefing for them and workshop for them. What should be in the briefing? I will be saying, uh, speaking about this in a moment. What should be in the workshop? Ha, huh, that's pretty much up to you because this is something I cannot tell you outright, not knowing your participants, uh, cultural background, experience in the in gaming experience in bonding i don't know the group i don't know if them they know themselves and stuff like that i can only tell you what you wish to achieve and what you wish to achieve is to open them up for creative uh, cooperation if uh, you want me to give some examples uh, in the q a section after everything else we can speak about this okay so then there will have the five acts of the story. Mm. And uh, in every act, there will be a challenge that derives from uh, participants receiving uh, a fragment, the scrap of memories of Robin Locke. And uh, every act will grant a new letter, a new element of the journal. So 
they find a piece of a journal, they see, aha, so this is our task. Let's go do the task. They do the task and they re uh, return to receive another piece of a journal. I will go deeper into it into a second. And the debriefing where the magic happens is this roughly organized discussion. Uh, I will provide tips and framework, uh, but this is the moment where, where you can push through the message. You can go into the social element of social gaming. And um, this, this me social message that you wish to make known to your participants. Briefing. As you can see here, there's a lot of keys. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to, uh, in, I will say different. I believe that person is a door, is a lock, and every person can be unlocked. You know your participants the best. So uh, if you don't, then you should uh, gather some information be beforehand to learn who they are, what are their potential triggers, their uh, likings and dislikings. Because at the moment of briefing, your task is to instantly unlock them. It's not hard, I promise you. Uh, because the premise of doing something together with their peers is already a cool one by itself. And if you are able to uh, add this little hype to it, then job well done. What have to be said in this briefing is and in this element, in the briefings, you divide them into the groups. I will say more about the groups of for later, but this is this element. Once they know what they will be doing, you, you don't, you don't allow them to divide themselves. You are the person dividing them based on what you have seen during the workshop and during the briefing and what you know about your participants beforehand, because the composition of the groups of the teams acting in the uh, game is crucial to the effect of the game. So that's about briefing. Uh, I think we'll carry on. If there are any questions, please write them down in the comment section. Now we go into the act one of our uh, challenge. In the act one, they need to synchronize themselves with Alex and Robin. So they receive the first element of the Robin Locks journal. And I believe it's a good moment now to show you those uh, journals in the design doc. Uh, please. Oh. Uh, all the, the journals and all the key fragments I will be referencing are at the end of your design document. So these are printed materials. What you see now are the are parts of the key uh, they will be gathering, but here are the journals. Uh, unfortunately, it's sideways, so you won't be able to read it properly right now, but as a rule, you have fragment of the, of the lore of the story, fragment of the Robin's insight, and task that is to be done by the participants. So a participant receive this piece of paper from you, and this is all they need. Everything they don't understand or they don't know, they are like inclined to make up. It's an improvisation game. Uh, so you will notice, I hope, that there are only Robin perspective on the story. Alex is mentioned only through Robin's eyes. Therefore, this person, Alex, is even less uh, um, concrete and leaves more place for players to elaborate upon, to figure this person out. 
so that's that's the that th th this is how the notes look like the letters. And now get back to the uh, to the webinar. So uh, this 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 first act is our demon hunters synchronizing with people that are they are looking for. They must recreate the way that Robin and Alex traversed before first meeting each other. So in this open area where the game takes place, that's why I recommended in the beginning for you to um, really take close notice on the location requirements because like um, towns or city square, um, public park, places that are on the uh, visual, visually appealing uh, side are far better uh, and more recommended as our participants will uh, move through the area and create photos of themselves or not. They may not uh, include themselves there, but imagine the, uh, the, those photos as snapshots taken from the perspective of eyes of Alex and Robin, and they must know, participants that being, which set of pictures was taken by Robin's eyes and which was ta were taken by Alex's eyes to see the difference on what that person would focus. They try to imagine what this person would be looking for and looking at while looking for the other person. And what happens then with those pictures, you might ask. Unfortunately, we must go a step back because every single task will have a digital space for it. This is element that must be done during the briefing as the group formation process ends with this aspect. I will speak more about the technicality of it, but just have in mind right now that they will have a Facebook group and every group will have their own Facebook thread. And it, underneath every thread, they will post their, uh, their efforts, new pictures that they make, movies that they make, stuff like that. And the thread will be symbolized, will be notified by the uh, picture of themselves, of the entire group that they make before the game just before the game starts. This is the first thing. When they take the picture, they are in the world of the game. They are, uh, they are not who they used to be, who they are in real life, but they are young demon hunters looking for A and R from the moment that the, the, the photo reaches the Facebook group. More on that later. So this is our first act. The second act, they need to understand, gain deeper understanding of the main characters. Uh, and they will, you should have some kind of library in the area or place that can be associated with books, a bookstore maybe, because they need to record themselves speaking about their most beloved book. Uh, by showing themselves, they show the affection to the things that shape us, like the cultural background we have, that was present in the people they are searching for, the memories of people. Then, as I have uh, told you before, um, those elements reflect stages of the story we discussed before. So this is the moment where uh, a and R only meet. They don't know anything each, uh, about each other. But here they are uh, getting to know and uh, getting closer to each other. Uh, and also they are able to localize the book which they are looking for. But now we're in the moment of the uh, argument. Participants will be here to 
argue with each other. They will have to reenact, like prepare a, a stage play, how Robin and Alex are arguing. So, and this argument must be played by one player and filmed by one player from either side. So there will be a cameraman for Robin and Robin will be flapping uh, against Alex and there will be cameraman for Alex and Alex will be flapping at Robin. So there will be, there will be this uh, movie of argument, of, uh, of tension uh, filmed from two POVs. Because this is the moment where uh, Alex realizes that the books basically kills them and is uh, understandably furious on Robin for being a douchebag. Anyways, the act four is this moment of realiza realization that even though there are problems between them, even though there are um, things that should set them apart, they are unable to because they are already in love. And there is a moment when Robin tries to regain Alex trust. And one of them, it is not set clear in the story who is who, is blindfolded and led into a dangerous area by the other person only by voice. And they will have to make a scene around this. They will have to create a short story, short movie, where one of them will be playing as one of the main protagonists with their eyes blindfolded and the other one is leading them by voice. And it is also filmed from two POVs. Like there's one cameraman focusing on the blindfolded person and the other one focusing on the leader. Uh, yes, so this is the challenge in the fourth act. And now we are at the grand finale. As our participants were able to walk through entire path of I and R, they have all the sh shards of the key. All four shards are now, are now connected, they are fit in place, and they should be able to regain their memories, lock the demon away, and they would be able to live happily ever after. But unfortunately, this is the moment where with spark sparkles and flames, uh, Tal reveals himself to the public and informs them that Haha, ha, it was my uh, devilish plan all along. You played into my hands like the little children you are. The demon possesses one person from every group and they are taken away. And as uh, the demon, the facilitator playing a demon, explains to the possessed how should they act as possessed person? The mentor tries to prepare the rest of the people to be able to make an exorcism, to be able to regain their lost member. And uh, what, is, uh, what is coolest thing about this is that up until this point, they were trying to play other people's story. Now this is their story and why demon uh, must be a facilitator watching them over throughout the entire game, not a person that just appears, because they had to have their uh, emotional uh, involvement into this person. This is the one thing. And the second thing, the demon must take the strongest person from all the groups. The facilitator was, must be witty enough and observative enough to be able to pick out who is the strongest, the most outspoken, the most controlling person in the group, and that uh, person must be extracted. 
uh, from the team to make uh, chances even. So this is the act five. If they are able to, I will tell you more how to uh, get back this person, but later on. Uh, but if they are able to get this person back, they win the game because the demon is defeated. But I, I can tell you even now, the de they whatever they do, however the scene will look like, more on that in the design document, but however the scene will look like, the gist is like this. If they decide, be, the possessed person says, give the demon the key and the demon will give me back to you. Exchange what you got for your partner. If you keep the key, which the demon cannot touch, uh, you uh, lose your friend. And the trick is that if they choose to give the key to the demon and get their friend back, they get the key and their friend back and they win the game. If they choose otherwise, then they lose the game. Uh, but there's another trick to it. If there are, for example, five teams, the majority of choices decides. So if three out of five teams decides to exchange the key for their partner, they're good to go. But if three out of five teams decides otherwise to keep the key and lose the partner, they have collectively lost. And this is something to be touched upon at the debriefing. So this is the grande finale, which is cool. Uh, and it works, works really well uh, with the kids in the end. So the briefing, things I believe are trying, are starting to um, appear and become clearer. But uh, maybe, sorry, yes? maybe this is a point where we can grasp any questions if there are. Yes. Sorry. Was something not clear or you have already your own ideas how to do it in your own way, in your own localization, then please come up. Uh, I have a question. Hey, everybody. Yes. Uh, so my question is just about um, these uh, roles that you said from the beginning that three people should be uh, like facilitating, let's say one demon, one, uh, what was it, mentor, right? Mentor, and the yes. third one is this facilitator, like overall logistics or, or whatever, right? Yes. So in, in this way, uh, in these acts, um, like, uh, I'm just wondering, like, when the demon is taking these people from the groups, who is there uh, from these three roles? Who is actually uh, doing what? Just shortly, if it's so, possible. Okay, no problem. Thank you. It's uh, all down written. I will just show you this one thing and I uh, uh, answer the question. I believe it uh, is relevant. In the briefing for mentor, staff briefing mentor, and briefing for PAL, there are specific rules how they should behave and how they should proceed. Uh, but overall, uh, mentor is the one preparing uh, all the groups. He or she takes all the groups and uh, coaches them how to be a demon hunter and how to get their uh, to make a great scene out of regaining their, 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 their comrade, because it's all about the scene. It's all about creating a scene here. Uh, and Demon Tal does the same but opposite thing with those people he extracted, he or she. The third person throughout entirety of this time does, throughout even previously in the game checks out on the Facebook if the uh, ch challenges were made, uh, helps to moderate the Facebook if there is a problem, uh, prepares next parts uh, of the journal for the people, uh, takes care about every single minute technical detail that would break the immersion to allow facilitators playing as uh, NPCs and participants just go with the flow. And in this last, stage, basically this person can uh, have a cup of coffee because there's nothing to be done. 
uh, because if this person done um, job properly, this is this is uh, those are the eyes that look on the par participants. So this actually, person actually can I actually uh, this person can't have a cup of coffee or tea because it's going to take photos uh, yes, of course. how the game is going on to report to us. Yeah, actually yes yes. <laughs> uh, but this is uh, this person was already observing. Uh, participants in every aspect of what they were doing. So this person is able to tell the demon who to take. This one is the leader. This one is the leader. This one is you take him, him and her, whatever. Like, sorry for my uh, implicit sexism, but you, you know what I mean? It's just, uh, anywho, this is what this person does. This person is absolutely necessary to have there uh, in the field. Here we got... Uh, a flowchart of gameplay. We will return to it after I uh, go over all the rules. But in general, uh, every act will play the same except from the fifth act, which I have uh, spoken to you at large in a moment before. So the participants receive a, pack, uh, a page from Locke's journal. Then participates receive a challenge alongside this journal fragment. It is on the same page. They have from 15 to 20 minutes to execute this challenge. And did they make it in time? If they did, great, cool, awesome. Uh, they gain a shard of the key. If they didn't, the, they lo lose one uh, of the soul fragments and then they receive a shard of the key. Either way, even if they don't do the challenge, which is unlikely, but if they don't, or if they are too late, they uh, gain next fragment of the key. So the game is unbreakable. It will go along the entirety of its uh, plot. Whoa, nope, not yet. And if they succeed in any challenge, they regain a shard of the soul. I will speak more about those in a moment. Uh, and then they vote uh, in the using the bonding ritual, more on that later in a second, uh, on the bearers of the key fragments, as every person in the team may carry only one fragment of the key. And then the cycle repeats itself. So... Uh, these are six core rules. Every, everything else can be changed. But these uh, rules make this game what this game is. Like I have spoken to you about the starting uh, point of the game, like the elements that must be retained in order to play the game, actually. Uh, these are the same. So squads of four, group space, key fragments, soul shards, story building, and bonding ritual. And let's go over those. Squads of four. You decide what will be the composition of the squads. And there must be four people in the squad, period, because uh, there will be later on four shards of the key. And it is important to have this dynamic where they are uh, equal not like two plus one. If they choose, they can be two plus two. There are, like, there are many compositions which may occur in this team, but they must be four, as this is a very healthy sociotechnic uh, group where everyone can have its voice, it's not crowded, and they still have option in discussion. And all the challenges are designed with uh, having this in mind. And you des decide who is where because you should not allow them to be in their comfortable uh, groups. People tend to stick to their friends, people they know. They already know them. This is not what this game is about. This game is about to bond an entire team, like larger group of them. So you pick out the quiet people 
and you put quiet people in one group. You pick out the loudest people and you put them in the one group because otherwise the loudest person would outshout everyone else and this would be this person plus retinue. And this is, we don't want this. In naturally, there will appear a natural leader in every of these groups because this is how socio-technical uh, behavior of human beings actually work. We naturally will have the leader in every, uh, every group in which we work, even if for a while. That's why there are squads of four. Now, group space. They should have an area near the center of the game, like preferably in voice distance of the main facilitator, the one that interacts with everything, which is shown to them specifically, you go here, this is your place. If you need to sit down, have a rest, have something to drink, whatever, think about something, this is your place, you stay here. But also they have their group space in the internet on Facebook. I will repeat, uh, you don't have to use Facebook. I recommend using Facebook, but maybe in your uh, area, this is not the app that they would most prefer. I will tell you what you need from this, this app to make it happen. You need to be able to have long threads of messages bonded by one frame, basically, because in the top, you will have the photo they have taken in the beginning of the, um, of the game. And then underneath, you will have strings of messages. And every other message will be another assignment created by the team. It should be a Facebook group because on the Facebook group, you naturally will have four threads, four or five or how, how many groups will you have there? Because this game you can play even with, I don't know, 60 people, whatever. If it's divided, if it's divisible by four, you can play it. It is most uh, awesome, I, I, I think, when there are 12, from 12 to uh, 20 people, because later there is a crowd, but this game is scalable ad infinitum, basically, uh, uh, as the, for, the, for the structure. And in this one Facebook group, all other teams should be able to see the rest of them, because this will be a further motivation for them. They can reference what others done. And then uh, there's more motivation to work hard, to, be, uh, uh, to not be signed off. So this is group space. Key fragment, it can be anything. I have pictured here a loads of junk because those key fragments that they will hold will consist of two elements. As you can see here, there's a fragment of the key, duh. You have seen the sigil of locks uh, earlier because every other fragment of the key will finally create an entire uh, seal of locks. And every single fragment of the key, I will show you in the design document, looks like so, looks like so. So different, different, different. They are all different as uh, the participants will be. That's why only one person may carry one fragment of the key. And uh, on every shard of the key, there is this piece of paper, which you, I recommend to uh, foil over. I don't know how I should probably say it, like make it durable. Uh, and on this fragment, there is a sentence which explains uh, another step in relationship to participants. And there is a, a, a directive, who should be the bearer of the key so that 
later they may uh, make the choice accordingly of the bearer of the keys i will speak in a second but here is for example wait a second <laughs> the most caring person here yes there will be the most curious per person among you uh, curious and attentive yes uh, here the person is the most trustworthy so every shard of the key uh, reflects a uh, uh, trait admirable trait in a person and this is very very important they will have to consider themselves know themselves to a point in which they can point a person you are the most trustworthy and so every person in the group will at least once hear that they are the most of something that from this group you are the most of and this is very important uh, and cool and works fine so the other aspect of this key which must be realized uh, i'm sorry is that it should be a physical preferably heavy and unwieldy object the more they'll have to struggle carrying it the better that's why i have put here a lot of heavy junk uh, i played this game with when people had a brick heavy brick and every key shard was on another brick and they were running with those brick around entire town trying to fulfill their uh, actions because to be called the most of something is cool and it's fuzzy and warm inside but it's also a, a responsibility which you have to carry ca carry uh, on your shoulders and as participants will not have any backpacks nothing at all you must make sure that they don't they can that's why they have their group space this is the place where they leave their stuff they have their water there when they finish the assignment they can go back and they can drink do whatever but during the assignment when you push them out into the field to act uh, they must take the the brick and run around with it and eventually they will be running around the place with four bricks in hands which is cool and they don't have to be bricks but to every bricks are cool because you can attach this piece of uh, paper foil to the brick and it's all 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 uh, in the same place so that's that's about the key fragments they will eventually create an entire uh, bricky puzzle now soul shards uh, these are the soul shards you will have to equip yourself with enough rubber bands to give every single person a rubber wristband because this is a fragment of their soul each group will have four members and every member will have one wristband and these are the soul of the group every time they mess up they lose a part of the soul of the group so they will have to choose who loses a fragment of their soul so it's not like oh whatever we're late whatever no 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 no. you tell me which one of you loses the soul and internally people do not like to do it it's like drawing straws who will be eaten that's of course toned down but we are hardwired not to enjoy this so they will try to either avoid this or when they already have a situation in which everybody has its wristband and this <coughs> i'm sorry okay that's enough uh, they will have this situation where one of them does not have a wristband and they know that they can regain it if they make good on their next assignment they will try harder to fulfill it that's that that's the entire idea of the soul shards it not it's not there to punish them it's just a matter of consequence and to carry on story building story building is this aspect that i have touched upon earlier in detail now i'll just to have to hammer this thing home they must create the story themselves 
you should encourage them. Facilitators acting as narrative characters should help them by uh, forging the story of their own. But this is a place where you're having fun. If those actors, mentor and demon, are tense, uh, not comfortable, that's why I told you that they should have some experience prior with acting, the participants will be tensed and not convinced as well. But if you are able to go in uh, with a cheerful attitude, like uh, open mind and active uh, engagement in the story, the story will create itself. Uh, and every, it, I have written down these journals in such a way that they can be interpreted in a million of ways. They can be, every person reading this can take something out differently. And as there will be four people in every group, the stories will mutate in different forms. And it will be interesting to look what they come up with. And in the end, bonding ritual. This is something that uh, I have, uh, of course, equipped uh, facilitators with. I uh, show you where it is. Uh, as for the facilitators, here, uh, mentor and uh, uh, demon tal, blah, 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 somewhere around here. Actually, no, sorry, only mentor has it. My bad. Uh, so mentor is responsible of teaching people the bonding ritual. And because um, the, 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 there will be a moment uh, in the beginning uh, before they take their photos and stuff, uh, you can show them and uh, this is the only thing in the game, I guess, that must be enforced so, so that this uh, ritual goes uh, exactly in the way that, uh, that it is stated. And I have uh, featured one trick uh, that I have learned uh, by using a toilet. Uh, when you are bored, when you have nothing to do, you uh, read things. Uh, things that uh, you have be before you. And they will be bearing these keys all, or, all the time. So on every key fragment, there is this bonding ritual described in detail what it should like look like. So by exposure, by having the brick in their hands, they will unwittingly focus on the message on the brick and uh, the structure of this bonding ritual. And how this bonding ritual works, uh, let's uh, use the mentor's version so that I don't have to crack my neck here. Uh, they must all stand in the circle, equal circle. They must first close their eyes. After they close their eyes, it's preferable when they close their eyes uh, that they bow down their heads, uh, makes it more you know, mystique and stuff like that, like a, a real ritual. They together count loudly together. This is the tricky part. A mentor must enforce when you're training this in the briefing uh, that they count together. It is really not easy in the beginning to realign four voices into one when you're not looking at each other. I have tested this many times over, and this is something that they must achieve. They will not receive uh, the next journal page if they don't do this properly after every act, if they don't do this ritual in their group space properly. So they count together loudly from 10 to 1, and when one when they uh, when they uh, when they count during the count, uh, they with using their open hands. Oh, sorry, like like this, not like this, not like this, not like whatever. They have they extend their arms before them, which is which makes it clearly visible, unmistakable sign, and they point with this open hand upwards to a person which they choose as a next key bearer. 
And when the countdown ends, they open their eyes and they already stand there with their hands extended in the direction of a person. Why they need to have their eyes closed? Because we control each other using our sight. Subconsciously, people can exert their influence on others by grabbing their vision. We want to avoid that. We want them to be there together, but alone with their thoughts and make a decision by themselves to choose a person which is the most of something. And very important thing, after every uh, act of the game, the process is repeated for every uh, key element, for every single one of them. Meaning that even if you had the most curious uh, brick in the, last, uh, in the first act, after the second act, where there is another shard available and there is new uh, value to be attributed, um, people may decide, well, actually, this one suits you more and this one goes to another person. Do you understand? Is it clear? Because it, this is very important. That a person during the game may receive different elements and may be a bearer of a different quote-unquote brick, different uh, key fragment in different acts because uh, statements represented by the fragment of the key more closely align with the different person. So first we thought that uh, this one is the most helpful person, but then after uh, attentive showed up, I think that this person is not actually that much helpful. It's very attentive and more helpful is this person. And this is very important. In case of a draw, uh, it's just repeated again ad nauseum. When they feel that everyone has a key, they do. Uh, and you will notice, I have noticed this, most of the time, even when there are not enough shards for every person, not enough key fragments for every person, they try to be nice to each other and move those bricks around, move those elements around. So a person that for, for two rounds haven't been carrying any element will receive an element just because, just because uh, we're getting closer to each other. Or somebody is tired of carrying a brick. That's why it should be heavy. That's that. Uh, Okie dokie. So that was, I might have took too long. Anyways. There is a question from Natasha. Oh, great. Come up. A question. I love it. Oh, yeah, sorry. I just wanted to ask, like, if, as you said, Martin, uh, if this, um, I don't know, curiosity brick was at the person A, uh, and it, now we are giving him or her something else. So, so the voting where the curiosity bricks goes to is done the same, like closing your eyes and doing this? Yes. Okay. You just repeat the voting for every fragment at the end of every act. If you have one fragment, you do one vote. But if you have three fragments, you must do three votes all, all over again after every fragment. For every act, uh, it is, there is uh, 30 minutes, which should give you plenty of time to, to, to do it. Thank you. Cool. Thank you for the question. It's relevant. Okay, let's continue, shall we? Uh, technical preparations for the game. We're at the finish line right now. This here, right now, what you're seeing is, my dear viewers, a comprehensive list, of course you have more lists down in the, in the design doc, but here are what I would recommend you as steps while thinking about preparing the game. First, you choose a place to organize the game. Give yourself a lot of time before, because choosing a place is crucial for the game. 
You should ideally have an open space where they can move around freely, which is uh, visually pleasing and appealing. And also in this space, you should have an area where even if there is some rain or something, they could be sheltered, uh, where you can assign them group spaces where they uh, won't be disturbed too much uh, after returning from them for from their voyages. And while choosing the game, it is also advisable to maybe think about your local environment because the idea of using the bookshop here was uh, taken because the NGOs that I was uh, working with, uh, uh, Impact Hub, uh, was uh, in a very good uh, terms with the local libra library and they just wanted to include them so that their participants go into the library. So that's why it's there. Uh, and besides, it fits well with the story. But you can add like those flavors in uh, as you go uh, to make them more acquainted with their own environment because they know the routes they used to travel to home, school and what have you. But maybe there are things you want to show them by proxy. Next, you choose the actors that will reenact NPCs in the game and train them. And God damn it. And preferably a month prior. Why a month prior? Because you want them to have time to get used to, get acquainted to the roles. And also you would like them maybe to help you moderate the group of participants. Maybe uh, pre like, I don't know how you work in your uh, groups, but uh, usually I have a lot of hype with people that I'm doing my games with. And I really, really, really like to, um, uh, really like to go deeper into the narrative and uh, prepare every stage and have a way out of every situation. Uh, great uh, division of tasks and stuff like that. That's why month prior is advisable. Then you inform players uh, about the game and you could already start a Facebook group that you will be later on using in the game. That way you will already have the participants on that group and you will not have a problem of putting them to the group when the game starts. And also you can uh, posts, videos, messages. Uh, you don't have to have prepared videos by us, but maybe you have like this uh, music that you would like to share with them, which goes well alongside the story. Maybe you would like to tell them, come on, guys, you will be demon hunters. I am mentor your uh, your teacher and let's begin our like, like our school of demon hunting. You, you can you can build up the hype towards the moment of the game. And they, from themselves, will introduce elements that you can use later on in the narrative. And you know, by a fa as a fact, that they will be what they want, that they will enjoy them because they are the ones that introduced them in the first place. Also, you can get to know them a little bit more. So this is preferably to make it about two or three weeks prior, not too soon, because the hype will die out naturally but not, uh, you have to give it some time to uh, make, a, make a snowball effect. Then printing all the materials and prepare all the items. Uh, and of course, remain uh, participants about the game and especially its place and time a week prior. So you, hey, 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 next Friday. Uh, you get my drift. Uh, everything should be done uh, upfront because you don't want to be preparing technicalities in the day of the game. You will be far too stressed out. There's, there's this, um, how it's called, how, how the tram is called. Anyway, the stress that you feel before the, before public uh, event, you know what I'm sp 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 talking about. I, I have lost the word. Uh, so you will have this, this will be there. I, I, I promise you. No matter how fond of the game you are, you will be uh, afraid of how it goes. And there will be myriad of things to touch upon. So you want every core element, every technical part 
done in advance and lay there ready, happy waiting for you. And Martin, I'm I... just here to say that you have 15 minutes only to speak. Yes, of course. Okay. And this is the last sentence that I am saying right now. Remind players about the place and time of the game one day before the game and intensify the hype. Um, disclaimer, you should set the time of meeting prior to the game, before the game, you, before you want to actually start the briefing as you don't want them to be late. They cannot be late. They, there need to be an equal amount of people for all the teams. So just bear that in mind. Oh, yes, of course, I have the briefing. Great. So uh, I got too hyped about the game itself and I was uh, concerned that uh, uh, I'm at the end, but there's a briefing. Never mind. Four stages of the briefing. Uh, Maybe let's, uh, sorry, uh, just because let's not run through it. Like the brief yes, is course. very important I, yes, of part course. for... Uh, for you also to understand as facilitators and thanks Martin for actually because you were pointing out through the whole training what is important and what would be said in the briefing part and I just would like to ask uh, from my perspective where the debriefing should take place like physically yes uh, this is this is important fact that's uh, uh, preferably this place should be uh, an area where you all can sit in a one big circle with all your participants. So if you have some room or some place, which is your headquarters, uh, you should choose it. But if there is a public park uh, and there's like this uh, um, remote place where no one will interrupt you, you can uh, choose it. And uh, as the briefing goes on, uh, main facilitator, the person that was conducting and organizing the game, conducts the briefing and facilitators, actors, can then sh serve as a guard to tell people, oh, please don't, uh, don't come nearer. We have the briefing after the game. Please like, le let us have some, uh, have some, some place, some space. But... Uh, you should have this opportunity to have them all in one big circle, to sit in this one big circle with all of them, because now you are all shards of the same key and the key is now reforged. Uh, so the briefing will take uh, part in four steps. Uh, the steps are rough estimates. There, there are no two the same debriefings as there are no two same games, uh, but hype, Feedback, inception, and discussion. What do I mean by this? Hype is the moment uh, when you are able to relive the, the most fun parts of the game. As they have all, hopefully, uh, experienced emotions and have things that they want to share, they will be buzzing with those. And this is the moment when you only loosely moderate the circle as people will be shouting from one side and from this side and from that side. Depending on the number of people that you have and the time you can attribute to this part, you can either ask everyone about something, but more I found fitting to have the situation where people that really want to say something, say something. And you uh, instigate this uh, further by uh, asking questions, for example, like this one. Because after you hear out the stories that they have to tell, you need to be moving them towards the uh, aspect that you wish to achieve. So first, what moved you during the game? You do not have to ask this question this way. Uh, choose the fitting way uh, to your participants. But what you want to achieve is to know what was important for them. Based on that, you can uh, assess how far you can go uh, later on. And what was the relationship between A and R? And you can ask them what this relationship was in details. What stories did they tell? What was the end of the story and stuff like that. Then we go to the 
feedback. And this is the moment when we tone down the discussion, moderate it a little more, and we try to receive opinion of preferably all the players. Uh, what is their opinion about the game itself? Because we want to clear this out of the way. If someone had beef with our game, with the mechanics, we must take it out and throw it out of the window right now. We must settle the matter, say, oh, well, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it don't. Oh, that's, that's a great point. Thank you for pointing out that this doesn't work well. You try to clear the stage for the main event. Uh, and uh, I advise you asking about each element separately. You don't have to ask every person separately, just in general. And of course, you try to carry the subject of A and R, their decision-making process, uh, who was the bad guy, who was the good guy or gal, uh, things like that. Still, you try to keep them as ambiguous as possible, you as a facilitator, because at this point, it should become clear that different groups of participants had different notions who is at, uh, of what gender. Then inception. If this uh, matter did not arise previously, this is the moment when you should drop the bomb. What do you think what the genders are? Uh, and this is uh, introducing the wider context. Because as they were speaking about their relationship, it was natural that they have pointed out their personal relation to this relationship, their feelings about this relationship. And then you just ask them, would this relationship be any less if they were of the same gender? And now the discussion ensues and they uh, either go at each other's throats or si make a silent face thinking about reality and they look like the Vietnamese war veteran. Uh, many things can happen at this point. Uh, most of the time, I found that uh, teenagers love to discuss these matters. But it is up to your discretion whether you wish to push this debriefing to this conclusion where they start discussing gender issues and relationships of the same gender. Uh, you can divert this debriefing towards, for example, them as a group, their deepening relations, new things they've learned about each other and stuff like that. Because I've shown you the game, now you know uh, what it amplifies, what it's tried to achieve, and I hope it will be a useful tool for you. And that's all from me and Roll Credits. Thank you for your attention. People that's that. stopping. Thank you so much. Uh, we have still 15 minutes to go. Are there any questions or comments or thoughts? Speak to me. Yes, uh, Martin. Can you can you um, repeat when when uh, when the game is off? You said like when when three teams choose something something, then they lose the game. So, yes. Picture this situation. For example, we have five teams. Yes, playing the game. We are at the moment where a demon walks to them and takes one person from every team. So now in the last act, every one of these teams tries to get back the participant that was taken from them. The participant is acting like is a possessed person. Uh, like, you know, drawing their eyes inside and you know nothing, Jon Snow, and things like that. Uh, and they try to reach this person. If, you know, it's like on the Skype call when you don't know if someone's connected. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Are you there? Uh, uh, so they try to connect with this person. And there's a scene where a person that is possessed plays a possessed person. People that are not possessed play that they are exorcising the possessed person. Yada, yada. It acts for a while. There must be one moment and the person that is possessed is clearly informed by the demon that 
yo, dude, this is your task. This is something that must happen later than sooner because we have a good time right now. The possessed person informs the team that, yo, this is a deal. You give that boy over there, the demon, the key that you just gathered, and I can go with you. I'm free. Or the demon takes me, but you keep the key. So the key for my soul. And they have to choose either one of these. If they choose to take the person rather than the key, they did a good job. They're good boys or girls. Sorry. Uh, and if they choose to take the key, they messed up. And now, from that five teams that we had in the beginning, the this th team decided to take the key. This team decided to take the person. This time, uh, this team decided to take the key. This time, as uh, this team as well decided to take the key. So already three of them decided to take the key rather than the person. What a awful people they are! Uh, and this they they saved the the, the 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 friend. So more people, three out of five, decided to take the key. They lost the game. Uh, what happens to the materials, uh, the mm, photos, the films that uh, participants take? Yes, what, what is the uh, road of them? Um, well, uh, that's why the thread on the Facebook page is for, I imagine this, and the, from the way it was played before it works this way, that they just post it in the comments of the Facebook. That's why these things must be short. And in the debriefing, it's a very relevant question. Uh, that you pointed here, they should be noticed, notified that the videos they're making are not uh, National Geographic full-length features, uh, half hour and a half. They're making 30 seconds, 45 seconds like this regular span of recording on Messenger. This is a natural border for them, so they have to organize their thoughts, what they want to show, what they want to uh, experience how many of the fi uh, films they want to create, but every film is no longer than those 45 seconds available on Messenger. And they post them in the comment section underneath the thread, naming them. Uh, what is that? What are you doing right now? And then you can, of course, go back to this uh, Facebook group, download the, picture, the pictures and the, the, the films, and do what you will with them. Uh, or if there would be some problem with uh, transmission of data, you can ask your participants to download these, uh, these items straight away from their phones. But if they will be using Messenger, I believe they will not have the hard copy on the phones anyways. But that's that. Okay. I hope I have answered the question. Fine. Yeah, so I just wanted to say this was really exceeded my expectations, for sure. This was brilliant. And the second thing is that, that that's not a question, right? And the second thing is that I just wanted to ask, like, uh, how many times did you, did you do this? Like, I mean, any of you, uh, how many times did you have these groups and these games? Okay, so uh, the game was played... Uh, like in the final version uh, that you see here, uh, two times in Poland uh, and one time in Greece. Uh, yes, am I right? Uh, yes. But the um, previous iteration of this uh, iterations of these games I've been using in my work as a social therapist with kids. Uh, for several years now, like the mechanics that you see here have been tested in games uh, mm, on, in different proportions in games uh, since about, I don't know, five years, six years. And there were many of them. Uh, for example, the bearing of the brick was from the game uh, Walk With Your Friend, where my uh, kids were carrying 10 kilograms, uh, like the chests filled with goods. They couldn't open them, but they weighed uh, 10 kilograms and they had to carry it over 10 kilometers. Uh, and it is incredibly inconvenient and hard and uh, 
very uh, strenuous task for them. Uh, but while they were doing it, uh, they were they thought that they were friends, but they started bickering inside the group. Uh, and this was the thing that they wanted to achieve in this game. So the, there are, I could tell you more about each and every mechanic, uh, but the, the gist of it is that the, the structure of the game as it is was played three times right now. Anything else? I guess not. So, you know, um, uh, have you witnessed the, witnessed the situation when when uh, when they get rid of the their teammates and choose keys? Like th they lost the game. Have you witnessed this? Uh, please uh, make it clearer. Uh, Ah, yes, I understand that they choose keys. Well, yes and no. Uh, it depends because uh, sometimes uh, they do choose keys, in fact. Uh, the mechanic of choosing uh, a person over an object was uh, used for me in many games. And even though I have not witnessed it in this particular game, like this iteration of the game, I have noticed this previous and... Uh, most of the time it is uh, uh, showing a deeper problem within a group. And most of the time it is noticeable uh, in the groups uh, where there is a person that kind of is a part of the group and kind of isn't like this person isn't value member, valued member of the group. But to avoid this in this game, to like manufacture their consent, uh, we choose the strongest person to be taken as a hostage, as a possessed person. Meaning that most of the times this person already was the most popular in the group and they will try to get this person back. They will have a full incentive of getting this person back. And this mechanic does another great thing because when this leader uh, is taken away from the team, immediately what you will notice is that there will uh, emerge another leader. Like the person in this group of three, next leader will emerge and they will have new experience of leadership even if for just one act. So, yeah, that's that. Uh, I wouldn't expect people choosing key over a person but I cannot say for sure, yes? So that's... that's uh, person's mind is a very complicated place. I'm manufacturing the probabilities, not the certainties. I cannot say anything for sure. But it should work this way as I have described. Thank you. And uh, another question. Have you ever witnessed the game where actually they combine themselves? Not that you combine them, like the quiet ones for... The uh, no, 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 it's not like uh, uh, I did this, uh, the, the situations where they cho chosen the key over a person were in the moments where I conducted but the game and I allowed them to combine themselves, to make their group. The question is about something different. It's overall, yeah, it's uh -huh. overall. You, you, you mentioned the, the teams, the squads are uh, made by you. The, like you choose who goes in which squad, right? Yes. Uh, have you ever witnessed the game where actually they combine themselves? Afterwards. Like, after, no, no. after I have no, divided before. them. No, Martin, you no, commanded in the very beginning of the game that you, as facilitator organization, should combine the participants and should make okay. the squads personally. Okay. Did you I began to answer this question in the beginning. Yes, I did. It does not work. It's a bad idea in this type of game. You should not allow for this uh, as the only moments that I personally seen where they chosen an object over a person is where they were in the groups that they chose because they chose the groups uh, always, always referring to their uh, most comfortable uh, natural groups that already exist. 
And also there were some people that didn't fit anywhere. So they were just thrown randomly uh, where there was place uh, that created the situation where, for example, we had a, a pack of three good friends where there was one strong leader and one person who was like, meh. So this person was thrown under the bus when the situation allowed for it because there was no previous incentive. Their group, their relation was already established. And this group, this, this game is about establishing relations. Therefore, it defeats the purpose. You should uh, arbitrarily uh, make groups in a such a way that they are the most in unnatural as possible, unfamiliar to them as possible, as this is uh, a game about knowing each other, about going out of your comf comfort zone, out of curiosity and uh, need to be closer to another person, to understand another person, creating a bond. But wouldn't you agree that this is also a beautiful um, uh, debriefing question? Like, how, yes, how come... Yes. You know, like, so the, the, the following question uh, is, uh, is it okay if we in our organization do it in mixed groups? Is it okay? Or for this project, I mean. Mixed groups, you mean what? So they mix themselves. Well, uh, the game is yours. Use it okay. the way you wish. I just uh, describe you how the tool works, and you can now utilize it uh, to your uh, to your needs. And it goes. Uh, it it would be also fine because uh, we will be, I guess, summarizing these games, and this is always a new experience, something to talk about uh, when we gather the information. Uh, for the project, yes, so I think there is no problem in it. <laughs>